Microsoft. Okay, so um, yes. So, and then we have uh, our feature speaker, Dr. Uh, Hung Lee today. And then afterwards, right around 7.15, there'll be pizza and drinks uh, for all of you to socialize. And um, and so um, the we'll event officially ends at night, but obviously you're free to leave earlier if, if necessary. And some of us will, will, will leave a bit early too. Um, um, the, the team is expanding and I have to say, I actually haven't met all of the team members, but my name is Will Xiao. I'm a associate professor at Simon Fraser University. I've been a long-term um, associate with the Venba community and have been um, acting as a faculty advisor for Venba over the last eight years or so. And we also have Dr. Amy Lee and Dr. Faraz Hatch uh, over here as uh, um, our uh, faculty advisor so, as well. And, uh, and many, many uh, graduate students and undergraduate students as volunteers. Uh, um, and we have a full uh, semester. So in February, March, April, and there's a, a we have uh, the following speakers. And in April and May, we're going to hopefully plan a special event um, that would also act as a social event. So you get more than just uh, pizza. Uh, Okay, and I guess one thing is that if you didn't, if you're not getting the announcement directly, the best way is actually to subscribe to our announcement list directly. So you actually get the updated uh, Vanbug events announcement. It's a low volume announcement list. You won't get more than two emails a month kind of thing. Okay. And you're also welcome to uh, uh, suggest your favorite speakers. Um, for our next season, we typically decide uh, the speakers for next season in uh, May or so, um, and we invite them accordingly. So Venbag is sponsored mainly by the graduate studies in bioinformatics, the UBC and SFU. Um, many of you are part of that program. Uh, we also receive funding from Genome BC, from Imagia, um, basically Connexia Health, um, Bengara College, Stem Cell, uh, St. Paul's Hospital, which provides the venue for, for this event. And uh, it's, we're also affiliated with ISMB internationally and with the Montreal Bug and the Tor Toronto Bug. Um, okay, so I will get, I guess I'll get to this when, when we announce. Um, so it's on my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Chen, who's a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Perahenny's lab at um, Microbiology Immunology at UBC. And she's going to tell us uh, um, about preventing pathogen establishment with host associated microbiota patterns across plant and animal systems. Over to you. Switch this. Oh, great. Yeah, take this off, that's okay, just to do a talk that way. Um, yeah, I guess I don't need to introduce myself, um, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk. I gave a talk here a long, long time ago and I'm back now. So it's, it's lovely to be back in Vancouver. Uh, so um, as Aline said, I'm gonna be talking to you about a pathogen prevention using host microbiota and some patterns that I've observed that are common between uh, different host systems. And I'm gonna to try to blow through this as quick as I can so we can end on time. So I'm someone who's always been really interested in chaos and order. Um, life is chaotic after all, but despite that, there seems to be order in this world, right? There seems to be a certain way of things working out. And there also seems to be patterns in the ways that some things work. Um, and to me, microbes and models represent the two dichotomies of chaos and order. Microbial data, as many of you might know, is extremely chaotic. There's so much variability, um, there's so much noise, and a lot of it is extremely frustrating, but it's also extremely interesting. And we can use models as ecologists and biologists and bioinformaticians to try to capture the signal in that noise, to capture the order in that chaos. Um, and so today I'm going to be giving uh, you an overview of two short stories, one in the amphibian system and one in the plant system. 
So part one, leveraging chaos. Uh, so in my PhD, I worked in a lab uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder in the McKinsey lab where we studied amphib amphibian skin associated microbiota. Um, and so they're relevant because amphibian populations around the world are being threatened by an emerging fungal disease called Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis, or BD for short. And so this chytrid fungus uh, lives in the environment and is able to invade the skin cells of amphibians, um, often causing death by disrupting, disrupting their ability to osmoregulate their skin. Um, and so because they invade skin cells, the bacteria that live in the mucus rich layer on amphibian skin is the first line of defense against these kinds of pathogens. And so a lot of what the lab did was look for probiotics that would help prevent um, infection. And the amphibian skin is covered in this huge diversity of microbes that vary in different kinds of ecological traits. And so these are just three that I'm putting up here, um, but these are all real isolates that we had collected from wild amphibians that we caught in the high elevation mountain ranges of Colorado. Um, and so the, um, the woman you see in the top right there is Alex Alexiev. This is part of her PhD, PhD dissertation work. Uh, and together we characterized a bunch of microbes. And what we noticed was that there's a huge variation in how well different microbes could form biofilms. And so that's the center row right there. Um, and so some microbes are really good at forming biofilms and some were not. Um, and that was not necessarily, not necessarily correlated to growth rate and also not necessarily correlated to whether or not they're inhibitory um, against BD. So that last column is actually a measure of how large the inhibition zone is uh, when you plate these bacteria on a lawn of BD. And so I was really interested in these metrics and in particular biofilm thickness, um, because in theory, there are a lot of different ways microbes can prevent establishment. Um, inhibiting them using secondary metabolites is an obvious one. So if you can inhibit BD on a plate, you can probably inhibit BD on skin. But something I was really interested in was knowing whether the sheer presence of bacteria in this thick biofilm could actually deter pathogens from establishing. And so what I did, was I used these uh, collections of very variable bacterial traits, and I wanted to disentangle the confounding effects of richness, thickness, and inhibitory capacity. And I built custom biofilm microcosms made out of um, mason jars and hardware components that I purchased from the local store. And I, uh, and I inoculated these microcosms with different combinations of bacteria to form different kinds of biofilms. And so this jar here, you can see the stainless steel hardware has this membrane on it. That membrane is where biofilms form because I load the inside of the steel with nutrients. And so biofilms are motivated to um, adhere to that surface. And so I put different combinations of syncoms or synthetic communities of microbes in these jars, um, ranging from richness of one, so only one isolate, all the way up to 10. And I also varied whether or not these communities were composed of inhibitory or non-inhibitory bacteria. Again, that's data that we got from the assays that we did. Um, and I challenged these microbes with live BD zoosporangia and used fluorescence microscopy to count how many zoosporangia were able to establish on that membrane after the biofilms had formed. And so the uh, sporangia counting was extremely tedious, and I got some huge help from a lab technician, Ash Wire. Um, I often joke that he's probably the person who's counted the most of sporangia out of anyone ever on Earth, um, and I think that's actually probably true. And, and we used that data and correlated it with things like microbial community composition, richness, and of course, biofilm thickness, which we measured with a um, standard crystal violet assay, super common in microbiology. It just uh, binds to biofilms and then you can wash it off and dissolve it in a solvent. Right, so what did we find? Well, we found that in fact, biofilm thickness is actually quite strongly neg negatively correlated with pathogen establishment success. And so here on the y-axis, you'll notice that it's residual variation in BD establishment. And so I'm running a model where I control for um, richness and for biofilm thickness, respectively. And there are signals in both variables, even after controlling for the other. And what's even more interesting is that if we take the data from biofilm thickness, so the, the downward line that shows that the more thick your biofilm is, the less establishment there is, it turns out that that trend is almost entirely driven by biofilms that are composed of non-inhibitory bacteria. 
So the turquoise color are bacteria that do not inhibit BD in vitro. The salmon colored ones inhibit BD in vitro. And so if you inhibit BD in vitro, it turns out you're good at preventing establishment no matter how thick your biofilm is. But another way to prevent establishment is actually through thickness. And so these are two different mechanisms that are operating simultaneously in a system of mixed microbes. Right. So we're going to move on to part two of the story. Um, I'm sorry I'm going through this fairly quickly, but we're going to start talking about plants. So the plant rhizosphere um, microbiome is extremely diverse. And in the lab that I'm working in right now, the Haney lab, they specialize in a specific group of bacteria called Pseudomonas that contains uh, diverse members ranging from pathogens to protectives to commensals. Um, and previously, they found really interesting relationships in these uh, pathogen protective pairs. They found a pathogen strain called N2C3, which is a Pseudomonas that uh, kills plants. So it's an opportunistic pathogen because it doesn't actually typically kill in the wild but in sterile conditions, it does kill. And so you can see the vast reduction in plant weight in the first image there. Um, a cl very closely related strain of Pseudomonas called WCS365 doesn't kill. It actually protects against N2C3. So in the second panel there, you can see that WCS365 alone um, yields plants that look like normal plants. And if you challenge it with N2C3, N2C3 is no longer able to kill. And this relationship is, um, as a side note, actually uh, inoculation ratio dependent, meaning WCS365 actually has to be inoculated in a five to one ratio in order for this effect to be consistent. If you inoculate in a one to one ratio, the effect sometimes happens, but sometimes the plants die. And I, I did a sh short um, experiment to see why I, I hypothesized that there are some priority effects in play where the first thing that establishes is what gets to dominate the surface of the root and prevents other things from establishing. And so I did an experiment where I inoculated either N2C3 first or WCS365 first to see what would happen. And it turns out there actually is a very strong priority effect on protection. Um, so the first three boxes in the box plot are just our controls, um, the protective alone and then the infection, uh, infectious one alone. I did it both on the first and second day to make sure there wasn't some kind of day effect. And then the second two block, box plots show that if you inoculate the protective first, there's full protection. But if you inoculate the opportunistic pathogen first, there is absolutely no protection, right? And this is corroborated with um, colony counting data, which shows that the isolate that you inoculate with first dominates the community. And so this is the proportion of colonies that belong to each strain. Uh, we use LAC-Z counting, but basically if you inoculate N2C3 first, it's almost 100% N2C3 on the root. And that's probably why there's no protection. And uh, a different person in the lab, uh, Nicole Wang, published this really beautiful paper um, on this relationship between N2C3 and WCS365 and showed that if you knock out a gene that is important for biofilm formation, so this one is called Cole R, you actually lose protective ability as well. And so in the last panel there, you see that uh, the mutant Cole R for WCS365 has no effect on the plant alone, but is unable to protect against N2C3 if you try to challenge it. And you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot like the amphibian system. Um, biofilm formation, the presence of biofilms, and the presence of a resident microbiota that literally just takes up space is potentially important for preventing establishment of other pathogens. And so all of this got me thinking, you know, how many different ways can you actually protect against a pathogen, right? There are so many different kinds of microbes in the, on roots that we haven't begun to characterize most of them. And so to find out what is happening in the rhizosphere, we really have to capture that chaos. We have to isolate hundreds, maybe thousands of bacteria, characterize them and see what's going on. And if we do that, we can find out really incredible things and ask really powerful questions. Things like, um, do protective pathogen pairs have to be closely related? We see this in Pseudomonas, but we don't necessarily know if that's true um, across the phylogeny of bacteria. We could also ask what kinds of traits uh, are important to define a pathogen and a commensal. And so what are they doing? 
Um, if we do assays to check for their biofilm formation abilities, their quorum sensing abilities, their nutrient use profiles, we can potentially find traits that correlate with either protective or pathogenic lifestyles. And finally, we could ask things like, uh, what do protectors actually protect against? So here we see that two closely related strains, um, one protects, one infects. Does that protector protect against other pathogens, right? Or is it that you have to have a very specific pathogen protective pair? And so to answer all of those questions, um, I started a pilot with the help of a summer co-op student, Eileen Lyman, where we screened 103 wild isolates that we got from a healthy wild Arabidopsis plant. And we screened them for effects on plant weight. Here is just the uh, Abazi model showing the effect. The red line is the mock control. And so the vast majority of isolates don't seem to affect plant weight at all. But the interesting part is two of them were very good at killing plants. And so these two isolates severely reduced plant weight. And when we identified what they were using standard sequencing, we found that they were called, uh, they belong to a species called Penibacillus polymixa, uh, which if you Google it, is actually supposed to be a plant protector, not a plant killer, uh, which is fascinating. Um, but also the reason why these are particularly interesting is because I remember picking these colonies and I picked them because a lab tech in our lab, Manisha, suggested that I hold the plates up to the light and see if there were any colonies that produced zones of inhibition against all other bacteria. And so these were two plates I was going to throw out because they're too dense when I was trying to pick isolates, but I held them up and I picked these two tiny dots. And if you look carefully, there are these very strong, but very small zones of inhibition. And those two are the killers that I actually isolated. And it was by chance that I happened to take photos of these two plates in particular. Um, and, and just so you know, there are actually other Penibacillus strains in our collection that don't kill, right? So here is the phylogenetic tree just showing all of our strains. You don't have to know what they are. But if you zoom in, you can see that our two killers in bright red uh, are closely related to another cluster of Penibacillus um, strains in that same genus, but none of them really kill. In fact, most of them don't seem to do anything to the plant. Um, this is where they are mapped in that range of effects. And so at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so the next step then is to screen all of the pairwise interactions, right? See if anyone protects against this, uh, these two killer strains. But here is the problem. I, the problem that I'm having is that I am extremely lazy <laughs> and I don't want to do that because this data alone took so long, it was so much work. And so obviously the most logical solution to my problem is instead of doing it, just to invent a new system, to test it instead, that's more high throughput. And so that's what I did. <laughs> With the help of a, a former postdoc from the Haney Lab, Quentin Geisman, um, we designed this uh, 96 well high throughput plant growth system where we could grow our Arabidopsis in these tiny micro planters and then put them in 96 well plates. And the beauty of that is because the 96 well plates are commercially available, you can use liquid handling robots to mix bacteria into the hydroponics that the roots go into, which means I don't have to do it myself. I'm lazy. So um, I spent the past six months or so I'm going to figure out how to optimize the system, which is hilarious because I think I could probably just could have done all the pairwise combinations by now, but that's not the point. Um, and finally, I think that I've figured out a way to grow them and to quantify uh, plant growth or lack of growth. I scan all of the plants using this scanning adapter that I also 3D printed and then wrote some custom Python code to extract green pixels and divide all of the photos into its 96 well components. And so I verified that this model system result, uh, results in the same effects as our previous system. Here I'm just showing you that um, with WCS365 and N2C3, we do see reduction in green leaf pixels with the pathogen and um, not a reduction with the uh, protector. I will note that some of the effects are slightly off. And in fact, plants tend to be more resilient in the system. I think, again, it's because of the whole biofilm issue on the dry plates that we used to use, we inoculate the bacteria directly on the roots, which means that the pathogen has nowhere to go. It kind of has to live on that root. In this hydroponic system, they have to find the root first. And so in fact, they're actually a little more resistant um, to, to the pathogen the plants are in the system. But anyways, 
Um, I did a new pilot test with this new system and I screened uh, about 400 plants and just did a subset of the pairwise combinations that I plan to do, but basically found that so far, most things don't protect. The only one that sort of protects is the ATY 4B2 strain. So that's the only commensal that seems to sort of protect. You can see there's a halfway increase up to its normal weight under mock conditions. Um, and just so you know, that strain is actually not a peony bacillus. Um, it's an arthrobacter. So in this huge tree, the red box is where my peony bacillus originally was. Um, there's a the blue box is around that strain, which is actually an outgroup to all of the other strains that we have. So it seems like a very phyl phylogenetically different strain is sort of almost protecting against these killer veiny bacilluses. And so the next steps with this is that we plan on doing some genomic comparisons between all of our peony bacillus strains, see what differentiates things that are pathogenic versus not. Um, and so uh, I'm going to get help from Sarzana from our lab uh, who's going to pilot that. And then another master's student, uh, Leah, is going to look at priority effects with these isolates and also how that is affected by the degree of niche overlap between these strains. So as you can see, microbes and microbiomes are chaotic. The data they generate is extremely noisy. It's frustrating. Um, there are so many small things that can increase the variability in your data. But despite that, there are signals that persist across host systems, uh, things like biofilm preventing pathogen establishment. And I think that our, our job, I guess my job as a microbial ecologist, is to try to find that order amongst the chaos. Um, and the way that I'm doing it right now is by using really cool novel systems to gather as much chaos as I can to figure out what the order is. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Uh, this is a combination of my PhD and postdoc work that is still in progress, um, thanks to my PhD lab and all my funding sources. And this is a PCA of our lab. Um, there were 21 people in our lab last summer, and so I thought the most effective way to represent our interests were to obviously to survey everyone their interests and then plot that out on a principal components analysis and then overlay their individual faces on their points. So yeah, thank you very much. We'll, we'll take one quick question. Yeah. Do you have a hypothesis about bioinformatics and genomics or orthogonal? Uh, <laughs> no, you, you know what? <laughs> I have no idea. I guess it, I think it's not that they're orthogonal, orthogonal. I think it's that people who are interested in one tend not to be interested in the other. And I'm not sure why, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Oh, you can take your computer. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hang Lee. Um, so it's really a, a bioinformatician that probably does, doesn't require a lot of introduction. He uh, designed and wrote some of the most popular bioinformatic tools that I'm sure many of you have used, especially if you're doing any sequence analysis. It's almost no way to avoid not using his, his tools. But I'll give you a bit of background about Dr. Lee. Um, so he um, did a, his PhD in China, the, um, the National Science, um, Science, China's Academy of Science, and uh, mostly worked out of BGI at the time. And after his um, uh, PhD, he went to Sanger Institute and worked with Dr. Richard Durbin um, before joining uh, Broad Institute as a staff scientist there. And since 2018, uh, his last five years or so, He's now an associate professor at um, Dana-Farber Cancer Center, still in, in Boston. Um, and he's also uh, one of the recipients of the very uh, well-known bioinformatics-specific award called the Benjamin Franklin Award, and uh, also a Sloan Fellow as well. Um, so without further ado, um, um, you just, uh, let's give him a welcome uh, round of applause. And, 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And it is my great pleasure to, I mean, to present my recent work here. It's actually a bit more like a review. Actually, someone asked me to write a review on assembly, and this would be the title of the, the, the review. So I basically take the to this chance to organize my thoughts. And so it's a bit, little bit like the review. And so I will start with just a very brief primer on what uh, uh, the assembly does. Typically, uh, I mean, for when we do shotgun sequencing, the, the, the black box, this, the, the genome initially we didn't know. And ideally, we, we would like to sequence through the genome. Suppose, I mean, in future that sequence technology, we can read through the whole genome. Then, I mean, we actually, you wouldn't be listening to this talk. But then, I mean, because we don't have that type of technology, and we have to share the genome into smaller pieces, and then load these pieces onto the sequencing machine. And this is what you will get. This is called the reads, the, 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 the sequences. And what the assembly do? is actually you kind of organize the, the, the pieces mostly based on their similarity between the, the pieces and you organize them and then you come back to, to, the, uh, to the, the, the genome. And uh, uh, usually, it's very for this type of uh, assembly. I mean, this uh, a common analogy is uh, this uh, jigsaw problem. Uh, so this uh, basically each, each piece is jigsaw piece equivalent to a reach and whole picture is the genome. And what we, how we do the assembly, basically look at the similarity between the, the, the reads, basically between the pieces, and then we come back with the, the whole, whole picture. Uh, but in practice, of course, it's, it's uh, not as easy as, as that, that one. It's, uh, it's more like this. It's, uh, you have similar patterns overall, this, the, the repeats. And then you have not only the 16 pieces, you have five to 50 million pieces together, these are reads, and you have missing pieces because there are coverage drops. And if you don't sequence to a high enough coverage, then you, you, may, you, you may miss these uh, sequences. And then most pieces are damaged, and this uh, representing the, the sequence errors. And this is actually not the worst of all. The worst of all is that you don't know the picture. This is a, a previous picture more like the mapping. And here is the assembly. You just give a power of pieces, and you want to reconstruct the whole, whole picture. You will even don't, don't know what the, the picture look like. And so the, the outline is like this. Uh, firstly, actually, I will um, first jump to the conclusion. Basically, what's the preferred strategy to, I mean, to do it, this telomere to telomere uh, assembly? And then I will come to into the details about to explain how do we, uh, how can we achieve the, the uh, TBT uh, assembly. And so the first part is this, the, the recipes. And before that, I need to uh, clarify what do we, do we mean T2T, T, the telomere to telomere uh, assembly. This terminology, so far as I know, is uh, come from the T2T T consortium. This uh, is uh, mostly uh, started by uh, Karamiga and uh, Adam Philippi. They started the, this consortium and they call it the, the T2T uh, T T consortium. And the T2T, first there's a T2T T chromosome. What do we mean by telomere to telomere chromosome? It means fully assembled without gaps. And uh, it's important to point out that this requires a uh, very uh, rigorous uh, evaluation. You can't just uh, assemble a county and call it T2T. T. You need to make sure that there are no misassemblies. If there are misassemblies, one each misassembly is equivalent to a breakpoint, is equivalent to, to a gap. And so when people say people, when people say it's uh, uh, really T2T, T, this this means usually means that this uh, it has been heavily uh, evaluated. And then we have the T2T chromosome, and then the T2T uh, assembly basically a set of T2T chromosomes. And actually, uh, arguably, even the human, this, uh, most of you probably know that this uh, T2T uh, 713 genome published in science earlier, last, um, not this year, the last year. And uh, arguably, that's actually, that's not true T2T. The reason is that, I will say arguably, the reason is that the RDNA arrays, these uh, Repsom DNA array, arrays, these are not really uh, 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 a the They are actually this uh, more like they, they represent the average copies of, of the RDNA array, but it's not fully assembled through it. But I said arguably, I mean, you can say it's actually also assembled because these RDNA arrays are varied between cells. Different cells have different copies. And so unless you do single cell sequencing, then you can't truly, I mean, uh, uh, to get the, I mean, there's no, I mean, precise that number. And so you can also say this is actually uh, T2T. And uh, uh, when we say T2T assembly, and often actually it's um, not every chromosome is T2T, usually we really mean, I mean, most of, or some of the chromosomes are, are, are T2T. This is a telomere to, to 
terrible. It's mostly means I mean there's no uh, gaps. And there's another implica uh, implication is that when we do when we say T to T assembly for deep Poisson samples, it usually mean we actually it's a haplotype resolved. Because in some way you can imagine that the two haplotypes, these are like two re 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 repeats. And uh, if you want to resolve the, the all the, the assembly, you have to re resolve the repeat, including the haplotypes. And so to that end, when we say T2T assembly for deep Poisson ensemble, it means it have it's also re 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 resolved the haplotypes. These almost have basically resolve repeats and resolve haplotypes. This essentially the, the, the same thing and using the, the same uh, algorithms. And uh, uh, here, this uh, talking about the, the phasing. Then I mean, I'll just give you a background about the uh, phase assembly. What the, the possible type of phase assembly? And so on the top, that's the the the, the ground truth, the, the parental genomes, the 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 uh, the this is parental genomes. And then most of the previous method would would, would do this called we nowadays we call it collapsed assembly or squashed assembly. And what is this assembly like? This uh, although the, the input is a diploid, but output is a is a hyploid. But it's not representing one haplotype. It is a mixture of the two haplotypes, and there are very fast switching between them. I mean, let's say I mean actually each time this uh, this blue come comes from the maternal and uh, red comes from the maternal and blue comes from the, the paternal. You can see the fast switching between them. This we call the collapse assembly. And uh, later people realize that. Uh, uh, with longer reads, and we can do this call, usually we call the primary alternate uh, assembly pairs. The primary uh, uh, assembly basically have long blocks or phase block, long phase block. And for the alternate uh, assembly, these are very short pieces, they representing the other half of type. But they, they don't represent the complete genome. Only the first primary assembly represent the, the, the complete genomes. And then there's a, it's a dual assembly, there's a switches be, between them. But uh, this is representing a whole uh, deep genome. And what we really want, and when, when we say T2T, -T, we actually implicitly assume that we, we achieve the last half of them, this half of the result. When we say we resolve the whole content, uh, actually, these are uh, the terminology. I, I would say they're not a consensus in the um, in the field, what's the, the half of result. But more often, by half of result, people mean that uh, the whole content coming from one half of and then in this case, I mean, we have the, the two counties coming from the, 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 the two uh, genomes, uh, two parental genomes, and it is recorded them. And uh, when we, uh, uh, before talking about the, the recipes, and so here I've just about uh, uh, give a brief introduction about the current data. First, the shell rates, and people are uh, uh, using a lot. They realize there's several hundred base pairs, the error rate below 1%. And the cost, I just got the email this morning and elemental uh, elemental uh, bell they sent me an email saying I'm explaining their two hundred dollar I mean uh, per thirty fold coverage you know and so that's would equivalent to two dollars. And currently I think Illumina will have soon will have their their machine on the market to achieve two dollar genome. That two hundred dollars for a thirty fold human genome. And I'm MGI is also there. And so in this year we will see at least three, maybe four. Uh, sequencing machine that can reduce the, the, this mark, $200 per 30 for the genome. However, shell rates are rarely used in, in DLO assembly these days. They only use as a, a for evaluation. They even don't they even don't use shell rates for consensus. And then this uh, uh, the long range shell rates, uh, this is actually used for, for, for the assembly. There are many two types in these days. One is the shell rate high C. You, you this using the confirmation uh, approximately information to, to you can re achieve really long time range across the centimeters. And uh, this is one of the reliable parts that you can do the phasing and do also do the assembly across the centimeters. And the fragment lines can, can be quite long until these short, short rates. And so this, uh, the cost is actually mostly coming from the, the library construction. I mean, uh, maybe when we achieve two, three, uh, I mean, $200 to genome, uh, probably the, the sequencing, the library cost is higher than the reagent cost. And then there's strength seek. It's, uh, it's less, but uh, uh, not that often used, mostly because it hasn't been commercialized. And so only a few labs in the world can generate this type of data. It's more expensive than high C. Then there's, uh, historically, there's uh, this uh, linked rates. Uh, I would say these days they are not used much for assembly. They are still they may still use for for say uh, semicolon short variant calling, but not so much for the uh, assembly. And then there's a now it's a long long reads, mostly nanopore reads, and this uh, 
I will often, often talk about this ultra long rate UL means ultra long. Uh, this rate is uh, uh, actually uh, quite often you, you, you used uh, for, for high quality uh, assembly, this ultra long rate. And I would say the game changer in recently, why I, I mean have this, this hot today is actually the game changer is the accurate long, long rates. They actually fundamentally changed how we, the quality of the, 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 the assembly we can achieve today. And uh, this is the uh, accurate long rate. Currently, the only entire available on the market is this uh, Piper Hi-Fi. And then uh, I, will talk, I will talk a little bit later, later about the, the another point, Duplex. This is actually, a, I would say, very promising technology. But currently, it's uh, not on the market. It's still in development. But it has, uh, it's, uh, ha -ha has potential. And then the, uh, this is actually many the main conclusions slides. Is if you want to do the uh, assembly, I mean, if you want to achieve the best uh, uh, assembly, I mean, what uh, I mean, what type type of data you you should get? I would say for the smaller small genomes like insects and also small plants, usually uh, you 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 should get high fi data, high high fi, and also the, the high C. High C is not always uh, I mean crucial to to this when the heterogeneity is very high. When the heterogeneity is high. You can actually use high fi to to face. You can get you will get two separate hyper Just and after the uh, assembly, you will get hyper resolved chromosomes. Or I mean, at least chromosome arms just be with high 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 fi data alone. And then for larger genomes, but larger this uh, like uh, mammals, birds, this uh, several gig gig base of the, the genome also maize. Uh, if you want to get the the top quality, uh, it's these days. I mean, the combination is um. The high five plus ultra long, UL means ultra long, and then trio, you see one of the, the, the parents. When you don't see it, have the, the parent, the, the, this, this combination so far gives the best, uh, uh, give you the, the best uh, uh, assembly. If you don't have the uh, parents, alternatively, you can get high C or strand seek, but so far the facing are not, is not reliable uh, as reliable as trio. Because in the trio, it, uh, you got a very strong signal about the parental genome, but with high C, um, it's sometimes you may make, we may make, make mistake, and uh, if you don't have ultra long rates, but ultra long is still deep, kind of difficult to 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 get these days. You it require a lot of DNA, and also I think these uh, different labs produce ultra long of varying quality. If it's difficult to get ultra long, then at least you uh, you should get uh, I mean high five plus uh, trio or high 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 C. This gives you the good enough example. So far, the human pine genome reference consortium HPRC is using this. Uh, uh, for the year one data, for the older data, is using this recipe. It's a high five plus trail. And in the future, the consortium plan to use basically the, the, the top two uh, strategies, basically plus the, the outline the data. And then, I mean, if you only have high five data, this still can give you, I mean, pretty good assembly, but it's not high plus result. And of course, I mean, that's not uh, time to time. Yeah. yeah, and then this, uh, uh, so far, a polyquality genome and how a huge genome, there are no fact, uh, satisfactory solutions yet. And people have been using uh, genetic maps. I mean, they, they, they can do uh, sort of manually, semi-manually achieve that, but not T T to T, and also it's not 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 automated. And so you can see through this. I mean, we are talking about high five a lot. All of this at least high five. Then what about the the nanopore? This current status of the nanopore assembly is um, um for the data that's available to the mass on the mass market. The accuracy is not high enough to do T2T uh, uh, assembly. So far, I mean, people have been talking about the T2T, most of them are achieved with, with the, the high five. So far, there's no, no I mean, T2T assembly with the normal or simply uh, just uh, one pass uh, not, not for the data. And we did have the data, I mean, there are Shasta and also Fly. Uh, we can do we can uh, do fairly good assembly around cross arms, but not in very deep region like centromeres and a very long technological duplication. They, they can't uh, achieve good assembly in those regions, which means there would be gaps in those, those, those regions. And uh, uh, previously I mentioned the, the duplex uh, data. I personally think it's a very promising uh, the, the data type. And uh, um, it is, uh, the, the main thing is that it, it can be longer than, much longer, not longer than the high five and basically high high five accuracy. Uh, so currently there are various problems. I mean, we can't reliably produce, I mean, high enough uh, throughput for the duplicate data. But I think in future, once we get, say, duplicate outcome data, I would say I call it a, 
a dream come true that would be fundamentally change the quality of the, the, the assembly, I mean, on top of our current progress. Um, yeah, they, they, this is the current, the current status and the, uh, I would say the current recommendation, this is not just from me, uh, this is from this consortium, HPEC consortium, and also from the VGP, like from the different uh, groups. This is, I would say, the, roughly the consensus among these groups. And so I will go into the, the details about the, the, this, uh, this uh, assembly, and I was, most time, I'm mean, more talking about the overlap graph. Probably I won't have to go through. There are ways to do the Dublin graph, use Dublin graph to do the exam as well. But probably I won't touch uh, about that point. And so it just shows an example about I mean, how the uh, how this uh, exam works is still a primary how overlap here that there is. And so we want to find a four bit when we do overlap exam, we found we uh, conceptually we do hours all alignment. And we found uh, four bits per overlap between reads. And so here, e each the, the arrow indicating the overlap. For example, this uh, uh, this uh, G uh, GTG, TA, TAG, ACTC has a four bits per ACTC overlap between the top one. And so this is uh, the overlap. And you add a arrow and be between the, the overlap. And just still the same the data, just reorganize the read a little bit. So you, you see the direction of the reads, you, you get this. Uh, I Actually, in some review paper, especially the older ones, I mean, they may talk about I mean, what's the next step to do the overlap assembly is to find the Hamilton pass through it. Here, the red line shows the Hamilton pass. It basically goes through every read, uh, uh, one one finds, and you use use all the reads. And this is the the Hamilton pass of this graph, and you can do the assembly. This is the correct answer in this case. Uh, but in practice, no. No examiners are really use them on the, I mean, at the whole whole gym scale. Maybe they, they use that in a small, small region, but not on the whole whole gym scale. And in practice, what we, we do is, uh, is uh, we do transfer reduction. And still here, the, these three thread arrows, the, 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 this thread one, this is called the transitive edges. And why this transitive, we, we see, just see the green, blue, and brown, these three reads. They are overlap, look, look at this. And uh, if you know the green and blue has overlap, and the green and the brown has overlap. You can even based on the overlap lines, you can infer the green and brown has has a had overlap. And so based on this information, because you can infer it in some way, the sort of the red edge, the, the between the, the green and the or the brown one, they are redundant. It is redundant. And so it's sort of redundant, and so we can remove it. This is step called transitive reduction. After we remove it, the 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 so the, so the red the graph immediately become much, much simpler. And you can see there are clear paths. I mean, this, uh, there's only one incoming edge and one outgoing edge, and you can merge them. This is called the, the, the unity. You will get the this graph, much simpler graph. And then if you, uh, then, I mean, this graph still has ambiguity, but it's quite fairly easy to get rid of it. I mean, there's a, a curiosity like best or like graph, or I mean, you, you traverse or you require a path that goes through all, all the reads, then naturally you will get the, the, the final, the, the final uh, uh, result. And on practical uh, assembly, I think the majority, vast majority of noise read assembly are using the overlap graphs. They, they basically essentially the, the method we talk about. And they often have a uh, error correction step. They, they try to try the sequencing errors. And uh, um, now on accurate reads, the Dublin graph is actually also a viable choice. It's uh, but different from short read cameras. I mean, for short read, we use a CT1 camera, hydro camera at, at most. But for the Dublin graph, when we apply to the accurate long, long, long read, they use 10,000 10, cameras. They require 10,000 base pair without any mismatch in the K camera. And this after the, of course, this after the error correction. And they also have the concept of uh, multiply DBG. And uh, this is the what the other mainstream assembler, high five assembler, Worko and LJJ you use. Um, and so the, the, we know that the uh, real lines matter when, when we do, do the uh, assembly. This is coming from the review by Sergey and Adam, it's uh, like eight years ago. And they basically, this they, they also show that if you use uh, you only you use, use short camera or require short or that basically basically base pair. This is a bacteria. I forgot which which bacteria, but this is a bacterial genome. And if you use a very short or live or short camera, you will get a very complex graph. Once the camera is long enough, this is a thousand. You get much simpler graph. When when it reaches seven seven thousand, 
at that time we call the golden threshold. The reason is that once the array is longer than, than 7,000, then there's a high chance that you can assemble bacterial genome into a circular genome. We visit on the far right end, this is a circular genome. You can complete, you can fully uh, assemble it. And this has, this is why this is, um, uh, the long read, people have moved to a long read when we do the bacterial sequencing. But actually, uh, what's now so, it's actually, these days, after I look at the assembly, it's actually apparent. I mean, this accuracy actually is equally important. But I would say at that time, I mean, not everyone has realized that the actually the accuracy also matter. The reason the reasoning is here. It's a, in human, at least in human, some repetitive region are very long. Human centromere can be in the some some worst case can be 30 megabits long or 20 megabits chromosome one. And in CM13, this chromosome 19, this almost uh, uh, basic repetitive region, central mirror repeat, repeat, repeat spans about 30 megabits. They can be very long, and there's all segment duplications. And for these long uh, regions, uh, current technology don't get a rate that you can span through the I mean, 30 megabits long. And if you don't get uh, um, the 30 megabits long, I mean, this, you lose the power of, of long long rates. And at this point, the accuracy starts to matter. This is because, I mean, these are different registry piece will accumulate mutations over time, and this mutation will help you to assemble it. And here is a, a example, um, a, a brief example. Here, these are uh, purple and blue regions. These are unique. And in, in the middle, there are tons of duplication. These copies are almost identical, except these green points with over time. After they, they duplicate, I mean, uh, this one copy will accumulate mutations, and there are related to mutations. And so, if for those rates, you know the rate average five percent, and the same the, the divergence between the two copy can be very close. And so, because you can't reliably distinguish these uh, green mutations from the rest of the sequence, I mean, you will uh, typically for the those rate rates number, they will just add all the overlap. They will allow overlap to be between uh, copies from from either copy. They will, and so the assembly uh, graph, the overlap graph will look basically look like this. It's one, two, three, five, five. These five rays, and then each is an uh, edge indicating an overlap, dotted line indicating the transitive overlap. Uh, and so, basically, the graph, once the assembly sees the overlap, you can see the graph is quite complicated, and actually, there's no easy way to simplify it for further. And once the assembly sees the overlap, I mean, usually, the assembly has two choices. Either they will arbitrarily choose the choice, assemble through it, then there's a high chance that there's a, a misassembly. Or when it sees this, uh, the subway took two copies, it stops. And there will be a, a something like either way they can't really resolve it. But uh, we see, but actually, if the, you, you assume the rates are perfect, there are no errors, you can only allow the, the, the exact matrix between the, 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 the rates. And with that, I mean, most of these, these errors from, for example, from one to four, this one, one to four, I mean, there's no real overlap, but uh, I mean, they, they have a exact overlap. But if you know that this green, Arrow is actually a, a real mutation. You disallow the it is actually the graph become much simpler. It's just a, it's actually just a, a straight line. You can directly assemble through through the, the region. It actually simplifies the 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 assembly problem once you start to use the uh uh exact overlap. And so between the now it's the this older now it's mostly the older long read assembler and accurate read assemblers. There are many difference. Mostly how to deal with I mean how to deal how to think about this uh, repeats. And so for those reads examiner, when they do the when they correcting the read errors, they may occasionally use the reads from other repeats because they can't distinguish. I mean, which and um, by their, I mean these target reads and other reads and other reads coming from the same region. They can't distinguish it. And also when looking for overlaps, like the pre, uh, like this example, they may allow overlap between repeated copies. But with the accurate read read aligner. It's a uh, this phase of error and it also re repeat error error question. When it's a uh, correcting reads, correcting sequence and higher errors, they will try try best to use the read coming from the same region on the same high habitat. And uh, it's a final build the graph, it's uh, only allowed to perfect all overlaps. This uh, um, I mean this uh, the procedure, I mean the difference sounds small, but actually the, the Prado effect is very huge. And so in this figure, uh, on the x-axis shows the different uh, aligners, I'm oh, sorry, the different uh, assemblers. On the y-axis, I'm not going into detail, basically you can just think this is uh, the error rate. If the error rate is zero, it meaning it resolves all the signal duplication perfectly. 
multi-copy in the perfectly. And if it is a hyperprocessing, it means that uh, mess up all the um, uh, signal duplication, all the duplicated genes. And you can see uh, uh, for the algorithm, the Adamer divided before 2020, and all of them had tens of percent of error rate. I mean, some worst case, I'm seventy percent. This means that seventy percent of multi copy genes are lost in in, in, in the assembly. But if you look at the more recent, the hyper new and hyper the point three percent error rate, they rarely mess up the the, the duplicated genes. And uh, at that time, when when our group developed the hyper actually I can imagine that uh, it will improve the the assembly. But I honestly I didn't expect I mean, this, this this large the difference. It's a it's there's a much you improve the uh, assembly over the old uh, algorithms. Uh, and then uh, we have talked about the, the accuracy and the, the length. Of course, the better is to combine both. You have, if you have the both the, the length ultra long rays, ultra long rays hydro KKD long, and also you have the, the accuracy. It's the, the better way to combine them. The current way is uh, basically is a. Uh, this uh, the thick line, this the thick, the thick arrow. This represents the high five graph. Currently, most of the the tools that use both types of the data is to, I mean, to build the high five, to build the assembly graph out of high five rates, and then thread through, and then align the ultra the thin line. The, these are the ultra rays. You align the the the, the thin line through through it, and then you you can you can resolve it. Now in this uh, in on the uh, exam, for the example on the left. There's actually, you can see there are two ways to traverse it. This represents uh, this emergency repeal, don't know the direction. But once you have an ultra-long rate, there will be only one way to align through it. And so you, you can resolve it. Um, and then the, the next is the phase of uh, the, the last of the period I talked about mostly the hollow rate resolve repeats. And actually I mentioned this a bit earlier. The phase assembly and the repeat resolution, they are the same problem. And revisit uh, revisit this problem, and I still use, use this example. And so there you have this uh, unique region, purple and blue, and there are temporal duplication is in, in the middle. If you look at that, actually the, the two red ones, these are like two habitats. And if you want to do face assembly, you want to separate them. And if you want to do, uh, if you want to assemble through repeat, you separate them. These are essentially the same problem. And in some way, resume repeat is very harder. And for this exact reason, uh, before 2020, we can rarely achieve the uh, this, uh, the phase uh, assembly. If we given a deeper example, we most often we will cap them and we get only one percent of that. I mean, there are papers I mean to that can achieve kind of phase assembly, but a very short uh 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 quantity. You can't get, get long term quantities. And uh, because we have a self kind of much improved the, the previous uh. Uh, histogram showing that we improve the, the heat theory piece, and now we can routinely achieve uh, phase uh, assembly these days. And uh, and uh, the read accuracy is uh, crucial for for phasing for the same reason as uh, maybe it's crucial for resolving repeats. And here's also an example. And here on top, this is a two uh, parental habitats, and this uh, triangle indicating the heat levels the, between the paternal and maternal habitats. And the, at the bottom, they see thin line, a bit thinner lines. They, these are the rays. They, they have some of have the red allele, some of have the blue allele. And if you allow inexact mismatch, this is what all most of the current I mean, older noisy rays that they do. They will allow mismatch because it's because here the altitude really is just too low. If you allow this, you can again uh, the, this uh, dotted line shows the uh, twenty four overlaps. And if you do twenty four reduction, you get one line. This would you would collapse the, the two uh, dummy together, and uh, uh, but uh, um, they, they 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 do this because this is the, the real data. I will show basically why they, they, they do this. This is real data. This is uh, the human genome. This is show the results, and this is Navajo data. And uh, you can see you can see on um, if you are familiar with IGB, I mean the top of this green bar. This shows the. Uh, uh, this is the uh, the potential heterozygotes uh, alleles. This a uh, color bar. This shows the 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 heterozygotes allele. If you look at this part, you can't really see. I mean, what are the real heterozygotes? But with the high fidelity data, data, you can see the clearer. I mean, you can see. I mean, some many of the these color bars on top are actually not real, because you can see clear there are fewer color bars down down uh, on, on the chart below. That become most, I mean, many of the, these are actually false. And this is with the higher accuracy, you can see the, the heterozygotes. And as I said, many of them do error correction. 
He says a similar refrigeration around the same refrigeration. You can see on the top of this raw, 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 raw data, raw alignment. After error correction, you can see there's no errors. It preserved the both of the alleles, but there are almost no, no errors. And with this, when we do the uh, phase assembly, we can disallow in inside matches. After the error correction, we disallow in inside matches. We only allow inside matches. And then if we go, you see, see that the right, and then still the same similar graph, but you can see there are no, no edge, no overlap between four and five. Because four and five come from, there's a one mismatch between read four and read five. We disallow the, the, this overlap. And after the, uh, the, the transfer reduction, you get a much simpler graph. You, 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 not only simpler graph, you, you get a graph that preserves the two habitats. You can see the two habitats, four, four, seven, eight, and five, six, they are separated. This is the locally phased graph. And if you look, look at, um, I mean, from top, this is a basically you get the uh, assembly, you control the assembly graph, you suddenly get this unity, you get four unities. This is uh, you preserve the facing. You can see the, the two blue one, actually you, you, the facing information is here. And this is the real, what the real graph looks look like. And each of the components, each of we call, typically call the bubble. I mean, if bubble is look like the sub graph over there, you have unities uh, around it. And uh, um, the problem is that in part, um, um, if the, the heliocarbon is high enough, say 2%, we, we actually will assemble the butterfly. Uh, I think it's 1.5 to 2% uh, heliocarbon. When the heliocarbon is high enough, you can get very long phase block. In for that example, we actually uh, separate the, the, the whole cross bars, uh, just into two, two, two contexts. And in that sense, actually, you don't really need other data types. They can do the, do the assembly and almost re re resolve the phasing. But when the, the heliocarbon is low for human, in case of few human, you only get a very, very, very short uh, phase block. I mean, like this, it's several hundred kkb blocks. And uh, so we need new data, data type for, for, for that. This is, uh, so we need either ultra on rays, uh, I mean, uh, this is trio data, data or, or high, high C. Um, I will be, be, be a bit brief. On this, this is uh, showing the, the, uh, how the high five you using this alpha long. For high five, the top, the, the, this is the number graph, this is the unity graph, and the thin line shows the, the alpha long rays. This how, it shows how the alpha long rays are aligned to, to the unity graph. But the higher graph, because, because re encodes, recodes these, uh, the alpha long rays, this is the unity number. For example, you, the, you can see alpha long zero. It goes through uh, 0, 3, 2, 1, going through these nodes, and then you, you have the, the integer. You, you, you re encode this out from the graph with the 0, 3, 2, 1. And so for each read, you can you re re recall like this, this way. And then these reads, actually, they, they give you, then you, you can do the overlap assembly around the, the, this read. This is how the high is working. Basically, they reassemble in the unity system space, reassemble the, the ultron reads. And with ultra long rays, we can do extra stuff like, uh, I mean, you can re re resolve this, uh, this uh, again, inverted repeats. This is uh, more like the tandem re re repeats. You can re resolve that, but you have the, the information because long enough. And uh, we can also uh, close the gaps in, in, the, in the assembly. In this case, uh, there's actually a, 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 there's a gap between four and 10. The reason is that the read five and six, I, uh, Actually, it contains in, 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 in read one. For overlap assembly, we, will, we would re remove this read. But after removing this read, we would, I mean, there would be a, a, a gap. But this ultra long, this thin line, thin black line, you are one, you are two. When you have this read, you are line through it, you can, you can find there's a gap there, and you can uh, rescue the, the reads there and back to the right position and, and uh, assemble through it. This is another use case of the ultra long. This, uh, this is resolve this. Uh, the structure, you don't write the simple structure are also uh, patched with the gaps. And then they also, you, but even with our offline, I mean, we cannot face the, the, the whole, whole genome. And then here comes the, the trio information, you use the parent information. And so in this graph, it's still the, the same one, actually previously already colored. Uh, the red one uh, coming from the math matter. How, do, how can we know, know that? Yeah, we can use camera, we know which camera. I will say, you do the uh, short resolution of both parents. And then you will see which camera only occur in, in the mother, but not in, in the father. You look at the, the short rate, just camera counting. But you, you, you know that this is, um, this is the uh, parental specific camera. Use this camera to tag 
this unity, this uh, each one. And so the red one are mostly coming from the mother, and the blue one mostly came or mostly coming from the, the, the father. And if I see you have that, and the next step is to spell the county, you just treat the, the red path, the red, green, red, green. You, you treat this path, this give you a county, this would be a 10 megabit county in cover the entire region and it's fully faced representing the maternal subtype. And similarly, if you have treat the blue one, you can get the paternal subtype. But there are issues with the, the true binning. The mostly is, uh, for example, the ethical concerns. I mean, you need to get consent from, from the, the, the parents. And when parents see this is all, I mean, all animals, even well-called animals, you don't know I mean, where to uh, catch their is parents. And so um, this is why I'm, we start to also use the, the high, high C for, for the face facing. I will show the, the result here. This is uh, uh, the high C facing result. For each column, there are two lines, two color lines. This representing the, the facing of the two, uh, two set of the, the contexts, high face and output. You can see, and the color, if it is very red, that it means that uh, most of the cameras, most of the parental specific cameras coming from the mother. If it's very blue, it means I mean most of the parental specific cameras come from the from the, the father. And if it's a the, it's a purple, it's meaning it's mixed. Actually, in this part, there's no purple since mostly very red, highly I mean bright red or bright blue. And this is indicating for one column one. This means uh, uh, most of on the top line, the first set, most of the I mean. Not only most, all of the counties coming from my father. And on the bottom line, all of them coming from father, which means this is a chromosome scale facing. You get the full scale facing. And uh, Stephen, uh, or recently, I mean, their group has a paper in cell genomics. They say they can use parental, they can use misdation information to distinguish between paternal and maternal genomes. When you have this uh, chromosome scale facing, you can actually identify which, which chromosome, which partition come from the father, which partition come from my mother. And uh, this uh, basically you can use the high high C for that. And uh, this is the graph for the assembly graph, the whole assembly graph. And here, most of the components, each of these long lines represent the whole chromosome. You can see this is now the pure line, this is because I mean, the two have a uh, mixed together. And on the top uh, left, that's the, that's probably the RDN array. This is this, this reference DNA array. They are, they are very similar to each other. So different chromosomes will join together, will mix together, we can't separate out. And also the some numbers on the uh, whole whole assembly. Uh, this is uh, five samples we have more. We, so far we have uh, more than 10 samples. I'm going to show five here. And you can see the, the size, the default size they showing the on the one is the maternal and the paternal. And you can see the, the, the only a couple of hundred counties. And the, this AON is a way of to evaluate the, the continuity. The 713, this uh, is more like the area under the NG curve. You can start seeing this uh, as an uh, uh, unsafe, roughly equivalent to uh, 50. And uh, 713 is a 150 megabase. And these, these ones are all more, mostly 100 megabase. This is very highly continuous. You can often, the whole quantum arm is a sample of the human county. Sometimes, uh, for this assembly, I forgot the exact number. This like uh, ten percent about 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 chromosome county actually ten percent of chromosome are uh, assembled T to T. This uh, from the the, the telomere to the other telomere is a uh, uh, assembled in full. For some other chromosomes, the more difficult chromosome is uh, wouldn't achieve that. This is the uh, and this means that we can just use um, this. Uh, I mean, you you the, this the data. These are assembled from. Uh, high five ultra long and uh, the, the parental data, data I took uh, think one day, a couple, a bit more, more than one day, you can get this uh, assembly and multiple console in TOT. This is, uh, I think it, it will be become a, a routine procedure. And this is, uh, we also do work on managing genome assembly. I will skip this part. This is mostly about the multiplex uh, demon graph. I will jump to the summary. So basically it's, um, as I said, the, the recipe, that's really the concurrent slides, basically how, what's the current recipe for the uh, uh, whole, whole genome assembly. It currently is uh, this uh, high five plus ultra long plus either trio or, or high, high C. This is, uh, uh, I would say the current recommendation. And in the future, this may change depending on the, mostly depending on the, the number of people how that technology evolves. And I would say the phase assembly now is uh, it's becoming a, a, a routine. Previously, two years ago, this actually that's kind of unthinkable. Actually, two years ago, but now it, it, it's trivial. Actually, 
and uh, uh, at the end, I want to thank the Hao Yu. He is the main HyperSM developer. And the Xiao Wen developed the HyperSM meta, is a build on top of the, the HyperSM to do the metagenome assembly. And so I'm also affiliated. I uh, work with multiple cons consortium, human pendulum, uh, reference consortium, and the TLT consortium, VGP, Diamond Tree of Life. And uh, they have given us a uh, very useful feedback, basically they give, give us some samples and where, I mean, we, we made mistake and then we go into the analytics exam. It's very helpful feedbacks. I want to thank them all. And I will stop here. Any questions? Mostly about uh, sample from an organism, but how do you see the future where you're starting to talk about more diverse population of cells, or even trying to even assemble like a little book? Like, uh, like how far are we from assembling a little book of cells? Uh, so far, we are quite quite far. There have been, I think, a paper published last year in NAR, maybe NAR. I think they, they were doing a single cell amplification of the whole genome, single cell high fi sequencing. But I think the uh, safety is quite low. It's like uh, less than one megabase. And in, in this, we are, we, are, we are talking about 100 megabase contact, and there is below one megabase. And so I think I would say it's still quite far from there. It's mostly, it's, uh, it's difficult to get long fragments from the, this, uh, this single cell. And also the amplification is very uneven. You, there's often coverage drops. I think it will be turning. It will take quite some time to reach there. Next, we'll have a question from uh, Zoom. Yeah, um, from Ju Zheng. Uh, they say, thank you for your excellent presentation. Without TRIO data, I assembled chromosome level genome. Is there any way to locally phasing in a highly heterozygous region? And if possible, is that reliable? Um, without TRIO, it's, it's um, and uh, do they have high C data? Apparently no, only, I think um, highly heterozygous, it depend, really depends on the, the, the structure. In the, in the human cell similar duplications, there, if the, if the you know, between habitat divergence is, uh, is, is higher than between habitat divergence. For them, you have copies and I mean this, uh, uh, it's, it can be such separate treaties. But in human, when we go into the this uh, the similar duplicate, sometimes the within habitat divergence is lower than the between habitat divergence. And what is called that? I mean, it's difficult to distinguish between whether it come from different habitat or did this come from different copy. You will make, you would make a big mistake. And so it's uh, I would say it's it's difficult. With trio, usually it's uh, it will be getting better, but uh, um. It's still more like, I mean, the are still more like to make, make mistake. For example, this amylase cluster, and the people have told us that they, we, we assemble in, in, in HRC, and people told us that we have made multiple mistakes with collapsing different copies because of mostly these copies too, are too similar to each other, but we can't distinguish whether this come, whether this is between half and half or within half and half, then we made a mistake. It's challenging. And it's, I, I would say, uh, their answer to the question is, uh, it's uh, how to be analyzed in a case by case basis. Maybe something from the audience. Yep. Hi, friends. Um, thanks for a great talk. So, one question I'm going to have all the questions about. One just, uh, comes to my mind is uh, with respect to the segment of duplications, you've mentioned that uh, the copies have error less than 0.01. Mm -hmm. um, we are at a good spot. Like, but we have all your copies in the genome. How well does uh, that pool play in this one? I mean, if you have a limited higher error between the two copies because they are older, they may come through more edits over time. Yeah. Okay. The question is, uh, um, I mean, I show that uh, for the very recent segment of the they are very, very similar, then it's uh, difficult to, to resolve. Then the question is, I mean, what about the older segment of the That those older, uh, the answer is that uh, for older ones, it's much easier. For example, if uh, it's, uh, it's uh, say, one million years ago, so for example, there's a segment of between chromosome X and Y of around one, one, one million years ago. That's actually quite very, very easy to, to, to separate. But actually, this region could still uh, pose a problem for the noisy reader, but usually it's not a problem for HiFi. 
for older ones, it's usually much easier. The difficult one is the recent one. This is below the error threshold that you're looking for. Or above the, the threshold, you look at the reads. Yeah. Below that, it's coming from. Yeah, it's something that, of course, I mean, if you only have one, one, I mean, if, so, if you only have one mutation out of, say, one per 10,000, still difficult. But on, in my area, on my area, only see one, one mutation, then I mean, still challenging to read the separate them. But if there are multiple of, of, of them, a few of them, uh, usually it's, it's getting easier. We have two questions from Zoom. Yeah, from um, Kieran. Thanks for a very exciting presentation. May I ask what the coverage requirements are for HiFi assembly, both HiFi and HiC? We're doing similar assemblies to DTOL and also the under or the Earth Biogenome Project, and have had slightly less than satisfactory results, which we think may be due to coverage. Uh, the coverage recommendation, I would say, for human data these days, I have seen about thirty-five fold coverage. Um, I mean, on our side, I mean, different people, I mean, depending on the data quality, on our side, for the data we have seen, it's like uh, 40 volts uh, is a, bit, a little bit better than 35 volts, and uh, 35 volts is bad, better than, than 34. This is the default data at our hands. But although, I mean, at other groups, actually, they report something different. I mean, some, some say actually 34 is pretty good. And for the high five, I would say, I'm sorry, for the high C, I would say about 34 is enough. Although in the field, people more often do 60 folds uh, high by sequencing. But at our hand, uh, we have seen that I did for human zombie, I think 30 fold is, uh, is enough. We don't see obvious um, difference between uh, 30 fold high C versus uh, 60 fold high C. Okay, we have one more question from Zoom. Um, from Shirian Bond. Hi, uh, thank you for the great presentation. I have a question. What are circular contigs that are generated by hi fi assembly on a diploid eukaryotic assembly? That are not matching to mitochondrial sequences. These are mostly assembly artifacts, I would say. Uh, it's, um, uh, for example, in, in, imagine that in a perfect repeat, I mean, repeat, say, multiple times. Uh, the perfect repeat, let's say, this, uh, uh, it's uh, 10 kb long, perfect repeat, re repeating, I say, 10 times. Then, I mean, default hyper assembly, they will look like a circular because, I mean, the, the tail and the star, they, they can be aligned together. And uh, this may this may happen. Usually, most of these are uh, repeats, uh, assembly artifacts in centimeter repeats. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, if, if we think about the projects like the Darwin Tree of Pi, um, they have to sequence animals like ants, which are very small. And so it's hard to extract DNA, and there is lots of what do you think? Do you think it's gonna be possible to improve the alignment tools to deal with those issues that it's very hard to deal with on the left side, like contamination and low low amount of DNA? Um, I think uh, Pabell have this uh, low input and ultra low in input. But personally, we haven't, I mean, we haven't really tried on, on those samples. And so I don't know how well it works, but it, 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 that involved uh, amplification. And so I don't know how well it works. But actually, we have some data from uh, uh, managed genome science samples. Actually, for managed genome science samples, actually, the assembly, I think, not as good as um, with, with, with results, this, um, with, with, I mean, the normal DNA input. But I think it uh, works reasonably well. So I, I I don't know if I mean for for say mosquito I mean kind I mean this uh, I don't know. But you both, I think the the problem is mostly I mean when you do amplification the coverage will be un, uh, uneven and there will be other errors uh, introduced in, in this process and this may uh, affect the quality of the assembly. Question over here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, Regarding phasing, so another common practice now for phasing is to use population data mm -hmm. and recognition data. Do you think that's also possible to incorporate that into the future of phasing assembly or maybe it's Yeah, I believe actually. There may be a preprint or a or, or a paper about that. Because you have, I mean, after the if you only use high five, you typically get around, say, five hundred KB, depending on population actually, uh, five hundred KB phase blocks. 
And when you have that combined with, with, with the population phasing, you can probably do very well, very, very good phasing. I, re, I think there's a paper already, a paper of preprint on, on that, uh, but, but I forgot who wrote it. Um, we have another question from Pierre and um, how much hi-fi, high-C ultra long reads are needed for the other approach you showed for, par for parent of origin phasing? Uh, they provide some detail. I'm a co-author on Actvary et al. and cost is a consideration. We're getting good results with one Promethe Prometheon flow cell and a relatively small amount of strand seek. Um, did they, okay. The, yeah, I still currently we are almost working on the, the human data, or I mean, from data from the VGP. We have a, we are tried on a couple samples from the VGP, and so these are usually it's the thirty to forty fold high five, and high C as I said, it's just, uh, yeah at our hand the thirty fold is kind of okay, and there's actually there can be, I mean we are actually not quite sure how I mean what's the coverage requirement for ultra long. I think the, the Adam group from NGRI, they, I, I still remember they say that if it's uh, higher than 30 folds, then probably, I mean, they, 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 I mean they, that you will get only marginal gains when, when the ultralong is, is very high. I think they think that the high five coverage is more important than, than ultralong. However, I think for the ultralong, um, at our hand, I think it's below 10 fold. Uh, okay, uh, clarification. Uh, for the ultralong coverage, I mean, typically people mean, the, the read is longer than 100 KB, and what's the coverage of uh, these reads longer than 100 KB, even shorter than they, they, they don't count. And the ultra-long coverage, I think is below 10-fold coverage at our hands, and that works so well. It's sort of work is better than, than nothing, but uh, uh, it doesn't work well. And for this sample, I think it, it mostly around 20-fold uh, ultra-long coverage for the, for the, as I remember, for the data in, in, in this table. And so I would say there's not a consensus. And also it's currently it's a bit varying depending on the two. I mean, the high is mean, one of them and then the workhole can do the, can do the, the, the same thing. It, it, it's a, it's a, uh, I think the requirement is slightly different because the difference in the algorithm. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Do What a long read because they're short reads, you just think you'll use the reference genome of the lineup, or do you think it's better to Repeat the question. Yeah, uh, the question is uh, it's kind of I mean, the similar version is whether this uh, long read can replace short reads for the clinical C sequencing. And uh, um, I would say, uh, it is again, it's, uh, it, it depends. If you get enough DNA data sample, I think this. Uh, I would say, and if the, I mean, the, the price is about the same, I would say long read always preferred. And uh, with, with long, long read, actually, I would say the, the best priority is actually you do the uh, assembly. Even if it is not fully phased, even if you partially phased uh, uh, assembly, that's still by, by better than, I mean, actually kind of by better than mapping the, the read back to, to the genome. And this is not there yet, but I think that I would say that is the future. However, the caveat is that, Currently, for high, both for both high five and the nanopore, they require quite a lot of DNA. And so, if you, you do the clinical sequencing, I mean, you need to draw quite a lot of blood to get the enough amount of DNA to do the, the, the sequencing. And so, it's uh, and also, for example, for tumors and so on, you just don't get that amount of the DNA to, to do the sequencing. And so, this uh, can be problematic for these type of samples. Uh, we have one last question from Zoom. Um, from Pranav Garg, uh, besides Hi-Fi assembly, what are other comparably good Hi-Fi assemblers? You mentioned that Hi-Fi assembly is one of the one of two best. What is the other one? And the other one is the other one is Workhole, V E R K K R O. That I think I have slides showing the name here, but uh, it's uh, not there. Uh, but anyway, the other one is, is work Workhole. It's divided by and maintained by the NGRI. And the work call is earlier, but it's the first assembler that can eff effectively integrate all the data and produce the, the, the assembly. And there are currently a preprint on the, the Bell archive about the, the work call algorithm. And there's no, no print on, on our work algorithms. And um, can we use comparison across assembler results to find problematic sites and assemblies? Uh, yes, 
but currently, uh, yeah, yes, we, 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 we can do, do that. But currently, uh, we are not uh, really doing that much because actually have um, this new functionality is, is pretty new, and not many people have, have tried try that. And also, uh, there are also other more dedicated uh, assembly evaluation tools. Uh, this new generation that like Flagger or Assets and Inspector, these actually do a pretty good job to identify these assemblies. Um, currently, we are not doing the, the, the comparison, but I think I expect that we will be doing that. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we would have to wrap up the seminar. Uh, please thank our speaker.